house up, y'all. It was cracking. It was popping. It's D about to react to this honest vid. It's titled Katy Perry. This is... Mm. <laughs> I can imagine him saying that. This, mm, mm. I just reacted to Katy Perry's album. It is up on my Patreon right now. Go check it out if you're interested in hearing my thoughts about the album. Link down below. Uh, but yeah, I'm very curious to hear what he has to say about it as well. Mariah um. Carey is not. She's well. She's fabulous for a throwback. <laughs> we love. We love fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> Katy Perry is in a perplexing point in her career hmm. because it's like, how did we even get here? It's totally normal for pop stars to ascend and eventually have a decline. That's just a part of the music business and life. The biggest artists in history have had declines or points where they eventually settle into being legacy acts. But what's different in Katy Perry's case is that she seems hungry for another big hit and a big comeback moment, if you will, which is also pretty common. After a low point in pop stars' careers, whether that be artistically, commercially, or in form of the media, many pop stars have bounced back, achieved a comeback, and renaissance of sorts. Some of the biggest and most oh, identifiable listen. comebacks she after a great. critical or commercial it. failure happens to be Madonna's Confessions on the Dance Floor, Cher's Belief, and Mariah Carey's Emancipation of Mimi. In recent history, we have Miley Cyrus with Flowers, who has struggled for a while to attain a hit as big as her bangers days, but she came back and achieved the biggest hit of her career ever with Flowers. In a perfect world, Katy Perry would have had her Flowers moment with 143. I mean, look at the engagement from when she first announced her comeback. I think the floor was set for Katy to at least have a mild sized hit, if not something as big as Flowers. She had her time on American Idol, which went extremely well for her. She had her Vegas residency, which was also received positively and did oh, well commercially. I didn't know she had it. And the controversies story. that plagued her had subsided. What was it? I feel like she kind of took on this pop underdog narrative. And honestly, I think many people in pop music bands went into this era wanting her to do well. She had a lot of hype when she first announced the kickoff to 143, but it just quickly descended into crisis mode. Now, obviously, this era wouldn't be Katy Perry's first miss. That honor belongs to 2017's Witness which in music media has been coined as a term. Like when a pop artist is going through an era that isn't received well, you might hear people say, said artist is going through their Witness era. Now Witness was marked by the term purposeful pop and saw Katie trying to become a little bit more socially conscious. And she also took on some polarizing promotional tactics, like her continuous live stream leading up to the album. It's safe to say that Witness did not live up to its more socially conscious direction. It also had a more low key approach it doesn't have those big hooks of Teenage Dream. But it is important to mention that she did take a risk, especially with how she presented her artistry. That was like these visuals are interesting. Well. And Katie seems split on how to market this album. Witness isn't all bad. I think it has two songs that are worthy of being a part of Katie's career highlights. One happens to be the lead single from the album, Chain to the Rhythm, which is slick disco pop that serves as a commentary on being consumed by the media. The music video is also one of Katy Perry's best music videos. I'd go as far to say the music video is a pop masterpiece and has so many alluring details and Easter eggs. The second song from Witness that I consider a career highlight is Pendulum. It brings that classic anthemic Katy into a modern context that doesn't sound forced or try hard and is as hooky as her most known anthems. A few years after Witness, there was also the song Never Really Over, which was lauded and seen as a really strong song for Katy and it did relatively well. Unfortunately, her 2020 album Smile did not live up to the promise of Never Really Over. It is a bland and forgettable album all the way through, and certainly yeah. not the ideal follow-up you would want to have so he after an era like Witness. Here. As most of you know, she kicked off this era with Woman's World, which in short is not a good song, and feels very 2016 in all the wrong ways. It's pseudo-political, has some of her absolute worst lyrics, and it simply doesn't have her heart. Even when Katy Perry was cheesing her past singles, like for instance, do you ever feel like a plastic bag drifting through the wind? That is a Katy Perry lyric through and through. It's a bit cheesy, but you can tell Katy's heart is in that lyric, especially <laughs> in the way she performs it. Woman's World was a giant misstep, and not just in a superficial way, but in a way that makes you question if Katy is aware or in touch with her strengths as an artist, as well as the current pop landscape. It makes me wonder if she thought that she'd just lead with the most basic, most nothing burger of an anthem and people would cling to it. Because in her past, she has been able to do so.
but you have to have more to offer when you're not the one sitting in Pop's golden seat. Mm. Of course, there's also the backlash with Dr. Luke, who's accused by Kesha of sexual abuse. Though Luke and Kesha settled the case and he wasn't found guilty, many questioned how she could work with someone accused of abusing a woman on a woman's empowerment anthem. Then she followed Woman's World with Lifetimes. It is a genuine improvement over Woman's World, although that's not a hard bar to pass. I love the chorus melody, I really think there's a pulse there, and it's a very compelling chorus melody. Did I video? I don't think but I the did. downfalls of this song is one, the format of the song. It has one verse and depends on the chorus to do all of the heavy lifting. Instead of earning and building up to that more natural flowing big pop chorus. Ooh, ooh, Number me. two, and I think the biggest problem, is the production. It sounds like YouTube background music. It is some of the most watered down and safe sounding house music to come out of this house music resurgence. And what makes it even more questionable is that Katie has touched on house music before. Walking on Air is a true gem in her discography. It is still a very popified version of house music, but the hooks are there, the personality is there, and the instrumentation has far more color and vibrancy, and so does the performance. And I want to make it clear that me using Katie's old work as a point of reference is not me saying that Katie should go back and recreate this work. My point is there are certain qualities from her older music, such as her performances, her earnestness, some of her production value, that shouldn't be lost with time. Mm. And that's not to say that they should even be the exact same within the modern context. In an ideal world, they would have grown and transformed with Katie, now regress to the point where she's come to feel pretty much completely interchangeable on her own work. Her third single, I'm His, He's Mine, featuring Dochi, was released shortly before the album's release. It's built on the Crystal Waters classic, Gypsy Woman. It's easily the best single from the album, and her best music video from the era. Dochi definitely steals the show, Katie feels secondary, but I think it is contemporary okay. enough to place Katie in a modern video. context. It's Not also Patreon. catchy. The single was officially debuted at the 2024 VMAs, where Katie was the recipient of the Video Vanguard Award, and she gave an absolutely stellar performance. Honestly, one of the best of her career. And it was filled to the brim with hits after hits, and showed that a good amount of her work still holds up, while her newer work falls so far behind. Mm. Also, notice how these singles came flying back to back which seems like a tactic for hit searching. They were back Out of all the songs, I don't know who thought that Woman's World was a great song to lead with. It is by far the most polarizing, especially because it attempts the whole purposeful pop shtick with satire. And I'd argue that it leans towards flat out bad as opposed to boring. Perhaps it's both. As for the album in full, let's talk about the highlights and what the album has to offer. Yeah, would you like? Sonically, <laughs> the album is pretty straightforward, sterilized dance pop. And for the most part, it sounds dated. I'm instantly transported back to 2013 and 2016 when listening to this record. Lyrically, it's her worst yet. The lyrics just come across aggressively rhyme-centric. And what I mean by that is rhyme takes precedent over everything else, even if it feels very immature and basic. Like on Crush. Is it a crush? Making me blush? Here I go again. I'm falling in love. Catching my breath. Whenever we touch. It reminds me of something AI would come up with. Not which for the most part sound totally soulless and unaffecting mm. and devoid of all personality. Easily her most nondescript writing yet. There's nothing on this album that is aggressively sure. bad besides maybe Woman's World. I do think the singles were not the right choices. The album as a whole falls into the category of not being all that memorable or captivating more than it does being outlandishly bad. It's just so devoid of everything. And that's what makes it bad in this sense. Let's talk about the album at its best moments. Wonder feels like the most Katy Perry record on the album. I love this It features picture. her daughter Daisy, and it's a pretty and heartwarming album about getting older. It's the one song where I could feel Katy Perry on this album. Gimme Gimme features 21 Savage, and Katy going in a hip hop influenced direction. It's okay, 21 isn't exactly selling the song, and Katy sounds phoned in. And when considering her other explorations in this area, Songs like Bon Appetit were far stronger. We then have Gorgeous with Kim Petras, a trap pop number just about feeling yourself. Sonically, it recalls Unholy in some ways, and it too is just okay. And with okay, I'm just grading it as shopping mall music or background music. Her best guest feature on the album belongs to Jid on Artificial. Jid is just skilled enough to hop on anything and make it sound good, but the song itself is just an irritating listen 
with a constant descending beat and repetitive hook. It just feels like an incredibly empty album. There's nothing said either. It doesn't peel back a new layer to Katy Perry. It just makes me wonder where Katy she Perry She ain't with went. these visuals though. Because this album feels so far removed from Katy Perry. There's nothing sonically or lyrically distinct about the majority of this record. I want to say that she sounds like everyone else, but she sounds so nondescript and so faceless and even more than just a Face. typical generic pop star way. Like this is an album that I would imagine that was created by an NPC or like a pop star that only exists in a grade C film. Like mm. this is the type of album I would expect them to make. Like imagine Ashley O if Ashley O wasn't good. There's nothing sonically or lyrically distinct about the majority of this record, pretty much all of the record besides maybe one song. And that cannot be understated. Like it genuinely just feels so faceless Teenage Dream is a golden child of the 2010s decade. Everyone knows it, it's well loved, and it's Katie's career defining work. But it is interesting to me how Katie has kind of become the Teenage Dream lady, considering she had two other massive eras before and after Teenage Dream. I want to talk about Prism released in 2013. It did extremely so well. Roar? I think it is definitely the point in Katie's career where the cracks that. began to show. Because a song like Roar, which was incredibly massive, also showcased a noticeable amount of artistic regression, where it felt like Katie became a bit more removed from her artistry and a bit more safer than even her previous work. It's Soccer Mom and Soccer Dad Pop. I don't really think the single choices or the album as a whole did a great job of progressing Katy Perry forward, besides maybe Dark Horse, as much as it showed that she can strike gold twice. Walking Out Air was a missed opportunity for a single, but overall, I think Prism was the very first showing of Katy Perry stagnating. And then we have the off forgotten and pretty much never mentioned 2008 album, One of the Boys, which is where it all started, her debut album. This is the Katy Perry album that's aged the best sonically. It has more of a pop rock direction and a more earnest stripped down Katy Perry that we would not see much of since its release. Obviously, there's the big singles from this album. I Kissed a Girl, which is catchy shock jock pop. Hot and cold 80s dance pop with rock influence, and it still kicks ass. Same goes for Waking Up in Vegas, but the gem of the album is Thinking of You, which showcases Katy's more diaristic songwriting skills. I often wonder why Katy Perry never returned to this approach to her artistry. Mm. It's still fun, but it offers a less cartoonish version of Katy. Now, there has been a lot of talk of Dr. Luke during this album cycle, and controversy aside, this album cycle has confirmed one thing about Dr. Luke for me. He is as creatively bankrupt as Katie is on this album. Oh. And so are all the other producers. Going into this album from a creative standpoint, I thought she's working with the person that produced the bulk of her most loved work and most successful work. Surely there's some creative chemistry there and there's going to be at least something decent with a few gems to justify her working with him again artistically. But the production is stale, generic, and colorless. A few of the instrumentals I could literally imagine typing in copyright-free background music for. It's that non-specific. It doesn't feel like it's meant to ignite anything. Katy Perry's vocals are incredibly touched up and processed. She sounds distant and cold on the record, and sometimes not even like herself. It's like she adopts that anonymous radio feature girl energy for this record. You know those pop artists who do these DJ features? You never know who they are, you can never tell them apart. At least for the most part. This is the energy that Katy Perry approached this album with. I thought, why can't he at least give her the quality of some of his golden standards over the past few years, such as Say So and Kiss Me More, oh, or even Kim Petras' earlier work. Hmm. But even when you strip those away, the Doja songs and Kim Petras songs, Dr. Luke's work over the past few years have been dependent upon recognizable samples in already popular songs. Obviously, that recipe isn't lost on this record either, given one of the singles. Given how playful and upbeat pop music is currently, and how aligned it seems to be with Katie's colorful brand, I could not help but to wonder why she didn't work with the people that produced Espresso by Sabrina Carpenter, or Daniel Nigro who produced Olivia Rodrigo and Chapo Rome, and is a very talented and dynamic Chapo. producer, oh, that's her name. or Ian Kirkpatrick, who's worked with Dua Lipa, where Stuart Price, who has been producing so many great dance records since forever. There were just so many better options. 
Dr. Luke is no Max Martin, his glory days are far behind him. Ultimately, 143 is a dead on arrival album. The You're title is called right. For I Love You. It does not feel like a labor of love, but rather a mechanical, AI generated, grossly anonymous record. Mm. Okay, those are his thoughts. I do wonder how much artistic control she had over this project because it varies artist to artist you know just because an artist is uh on the bigger side that doesn't mean that they have as much say so you know when it comes to their art so i am interested about that but yes i already gave my thoughts on this album <laughs> Link down below if you're interested in hearing what I think about each song. But y'all let me know what y'all think. Let me know what other videos you want to watch, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye!